Thank you, Norbert, for the introduction, and thank you for the organizer uh, for inviting me. This has been a very uh, interesting program. Um, so today I'll tell you about some recent results uh, that we have uh, showing, uh, well, showing evidence uh, for quantum advantages in the problem of energy minimization. Now, I don't need to tell you that the problem of minimizing energy is a very fundamental problem in basically any field that you can think of. Uh, broadly speaking, this problem is basically you're given an energy function that maps uh, a domain, uh, which could be, for example, a, bit, a set of bit strings or maybe uh, some quantum set of quantum states. Uh, and the energy function maps this uh, uh, domain to some real number. And you would, the goal is to basically find some point in the domain space so that the, the energy is minimized uh, or as close to the global minimum as possible. Now, in classical systems, uh, usually the domain people think of are uh, bit strings or maybe a set of real numbers, uh, or they could also be a subset of, of, of these things. And you see this type of problems showing up in essentially all kinds of situations like route planning, portfolio optimization, uh, uh, energy grid, uh, you know, resource allocation, for example. Uh, so there's, you know, basically a lot of real world problems can be cast as minimizing the energy of some classical system. Uh, and for quantum system, of course, uh, uh, there's connection to fundamental problems in quantum uh, many body physics and quantum chemistry. And here, the the the, uh, the domain is basically the set of uh, uh, density matrices uh, and and you want to minimize uh, the energy of, of this. Maybe, for example, it could be uh, just the, 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 uh, the expectation of, the, of some uh, Hermitian uh, operator. Uh, uh, and and uh, the goal here is to you know, find some quantum state that has the lowest energy as possible. And you see this in you know, uh, thin systems, molecules. Uh, and, and for both of these type of uh, systems, there's actually a lot of uh, classical algorithms uh, that people have uh, already developed for decades. Uh, and uh, it's not surprising that uh, there's many classical algorithms for, for, that are very successful for classical systems, uh, such as linear programming, semi-definite programming, uh, relaxation, gradient descent, Bayesian optimization, simulated annealing. The list goes on and on. And a lot of times, even though the problems you're trying to solve are uh, uh, presumably very hard, like MP hard in the in the worst case, still these these algorithms are, are, are very successful uh, for typical instances. Uh, and for the case of the quantum systems, even though the the problem is quantum, and uh, but but still, since we don't have a quantum uh, computer yet, uh, there's we also have seen talks from earlier this week where we have seen very surprising uh, efficacy of classical algorithms such as tensor networks, quantum Monte Carlo, density functional theory, and even a neural network on SAS that have been very successful in minimizing energies of, of quantum systems. So given the success of these classical algorithms for you know, both type of systems, uh, you know, it's unclear if there's you know, any like, a quantum advantage in, in you know, solving the problem of energy minimi minimization. Uh, uh, and this talk, I'm going to give you some rigorous theor theoretical evidence for advantages for quantum algorithms uh, for both cases. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully that will basically, I think, excite people about the prospects of actually realizing this uh, uh, in, the, in the future when we have a quantum computer. Okay, so uh, this talk will have two parts. The first part is gonna be about the minimizing uh, the energy of, of classical systems. Uh, and this is based on work uh, done with uh, colleagues at uh, MIT, Google, uh, Berkeley, and, uh, and Chicago. So uh, we're going to start with an example, classical problem, the, the problem of max cut, which was uh, alluded to in uh, Ojas's talk on, on Monday. Uh, so uh, you can also think of this as a you know, diluted uh, spin glass model uh, for condensed matter theorists. Uh, and uh, the goal here is that if you, you're, given a, if you're given a graph and you want to find a bipartition of vertices that cuts the most number of edges. And the energy function, uh, or the cost function, you can write it as uh, sum over the, the edges. Uh, 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 and for each edge, it contributes this term, uh, where the, the variables on each, on each uh, vertex is a, 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 a plus or minus one um, value that we denote as z. Uh, and if the two spins uh, across an edge uh, disagree, then the, the, uh, this term contributes one. And if, uh, if they agree, they contribute zero. So basically, you want to maximize the number of disagreements across all the edges. 
uh, a more physical way of thinking about this is you're, you're minimizing the energy of some uh, anti-ferromagnetic uh, Ising spin glass. So for this problem, uh, as uh, also mentioned in Ojis' talk on Monday, uh, uh, it turns out that uh, random guessing already can guarantee that for any graph, you can uh, find a, a, a bit string that cuts uh, at least one half times the maximum uh, cut. Uh, so, so actually for this part of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about really maximizing energy instead of minimizing, so just, just so you don't com get confused. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, in, so th that has been the state of the art for like, I think 30 years, uh, but then in 1995, there's this seminal work by Goldman and Williamson showing that using the technique of semi-definite programming, you can actually uh, guarantee that for any graph, you can produce uh, a bit string that's cuts, cuts, uh, uh, that's point uh, uh, A7, A times the maximum cut. So uh, this has been the state of the art for uh, since then, and it's actually believed that uh, pending sort of this uh, conjecture called Unique's game, uh, going improving upon this uh, uh, will actually be NP hard. Now. It uh, has been a kind of open question, like uh, how does quantum algorithms do on, on these type of problems? Uh, and that was sort of, you know, uh, 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 progress was made uh, in 2014 when uh, Farhi Goldstone and Gutman introduced the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. So probably most of you have heard about this, but just uh, briefly to review, the, 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 uh, the setup is, uh, uh, you assign uh, basically a qubit to each of the, the bit variables, and you initialize them in the, in the plus state. Uh, and then you apply an alternating sequence of unitaries, uh, the first being the evolution of the cost function uh, in the Z basis, and then the second uh, is the mixing unitary uh, with single qubit rotation uh, in the X direction. And then you apply this uh, alternating unitaries uh, uh, with up to, say, P layers according to some parameters, uh, gamma and beta. Uh, you measure in the quantum state uh, in the Z basis to get a bit string, and by choosing the good, uh, by choosing parameters gamma and beta uh, uh, cleverly, you can try to uh, maximize basically the, the expected value of the cost function that you get. Uh, and in this algorithm, uh, when it was pro proposed, it was attractive because it's one of the simplest algorithms that you could write down. So it's friendly for NISC implementations. And indeed, it has been tested in many platforms such as ions, uh, superconducting qubits, and, and neutral atoms. And also, this algorithm is very quantum because it has been proven that uh, you cannot classically sample from the output distribution of QAOA even at the lowest uh, depth, p equals one, uh, assuming reasonable complexity theoretic uh, conjectures. And, and this is sort of similar in flavor to the uh, conjectures in sort of supremacy proposals, uh, like in Bill's talk. Uh, now, Finally, uh, an important property about this algorithm is that they are, uh, they are, we can actually prove that there are parameters uh, that guarantees uh, that as the depth of the algorithm p goes to infinity, uh, you can get the, the maximum, uh, uh, or if, uh, so suppose you're, you're trying to maximize the cost, the, the energy, instead of minimizing. Um, and, but, but the problem with this is that you know, this proof relies on a reduction to the adiabatic algorithm, and it might naively require p to scale exponentially, while in practice, uh, it might actually do, be much more favorable. Now, uh, when the QAOA was uh, first proposed, uh, it was uh, kind of an exciting result because you can actually uh, rigorously prove performance guarantees uh, for, this, uh, for this algorithm uh, using the something called the subgraph picture. So consider, for example, the, the problem of max cut on three regular graphs. So by three regular, I mean uh, every vertex in the graph is connected to exactly three other vertices. And the cost function uh, is shown again there in the, in, the, in, the, in the poly Z basis. Now, if you consider the lowest depth uh, QAOA at P equals one, the performance of the algorithm can be uh, evaluated independently for each edge, JK, uh, which contributes uh, the following term. Uh, so you basically, you look at the expectation of this uh, just a single uh, sort of uh, edge, uh, and you can look at it in the Heisenberg picture. Uh, and if you look at this operator in the Heisenberg picture, it's uh, because of the fact that you know in each layer of the the, the, the algorithm, you only connect nearest neighbor on the graph. Uh, 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 for this particular uh, uh, three regular graph example, uh, this Heisenberg operator can only be supported on three types of subgraph. Uh, so, for example, if you look at the edge between node three and four, it's supported on the, uh, the subgraph of type two. Uh, and if you look at the edge between eight and 14, it's supported on 
uh, subgraph of type 3. So, so, so again, B is a sum over all x, and C is a sum over all zz's, or? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? So B and C in this case. Oh, yes, B is a sum over a single qubit x, and C is a cost function. So okay. it's uh, sum over z i z z j z case. OK, but in both cases, it's an equal weight sum that's fixed. It's an equal weight sum, yes. OK, so what this means is that uh, you know, uh, even though the, the quantum state could be very complicated, uh, it's actually how you entangle sampling from this uh, is classically hard, but you could still compute this by looking at, uh, uh, if you're given, giving me any three regular graph, no matter how large it is, you can basically go through every single edge and basically classify them according to which subgraph type it is, and then you can evaluate the performance of the algorithm without having a quantum computer. And this is what allowed uh, Farhi, uh, Goldman, and, and a Goldstone and Gutman to, to prove that in the worst case, you can get a, a, a worst case guarantee of getting a cut that's uh, at least 0.6924 times the maximum cut, and that beats random guessing, but not the, the state of the art classic algorithms uh, semi definite programming. Your subgraphs can get large, is that right? Yes, as the depth of the algorithm gets larger, it, you know, it grows exponentially, the, the size, and uh, actually that's exactly what I was going to show, uh, uh, say after, uh, right after this. Uh, be, uh, be, because of the fact that the subgraph gets exponentially large, uh, this, becomes, this, this approach becomes intractable because uh, the complexity of evaluating this expectation grows doubly exponentially in P. So what do you gain? Sorry? What did you gain then? Uh, well, going to larger P, we know you can improve the performance. Uh, so you can presumably get a better worst case guarantee. So people have taken this to, I think, recently, like a few years ago, to P equals 2, and you get a better number. But you know, that already is basically very difficult. There's like hundreds of possible subgraphs. And you know, it basically, it's impossible at P equals 3 with current technology. OK, so, so this worst case guarantee type uh, you know, proofs are, are nice, but they are very difficult, as I just explained. But what about average case? So, well, if you look at a random regular graph, like a random deregular graph, uh, we actually know from statistical uh, theory that uh, if you, uh, uh, with high probability, uh, if you give me a random deregular graph, the maximum cut, uh, when normalized by the number of edges, is one half plus some number that I call V max. Uh, divided by the square root of the degree. So this Vmax, uh, it, it actually does depend on the degree of the, the regular graph, uh, but as d goes to infinity, uh, uh, this, is, this is result in 2017 that proves that it converges to a constant that you can calculate to like 15 decimals. This is the, the so-called Parisi value. So this is kind of an interesting situation because uh, we actually know, you know, even without giving me a, a, a graph, like you know, if you give me a random graph, I can predict you know, what the maximum cut is, but finding it is still difficult. So, uh, so what is the best algorithm for this? So, so the best assumption-free algorithm, uh, meaning that you know, things that you, uh, an algorithm where you, the performance you can improve without assuming any conjectures, uh, gets, uh, so we only care about basically uh, this uh, second part, because the first part, the one half, just kind of comes from this trivial part of the, 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 the energy, the cost function. So we only really care about this part, uh, and, and, and we want to compare this to the, to the optimal value, 0.763. And for these uh, state-of-the-art assumption-free classical algorithms, uh, such as, say, semi-definite programming or, or local algorithms like the Gaussian wave process, you can show that uh, this gets sort of this value of 2 over pi. Uh, which is 0.636, uh, which is strictly worse, as you can see. Uh, but a few years ago, assuming a conjecture uh, that uh, they call it a no OGP, which you know you don't really need to know what it is, uh, but you know it's just name of the conjecture. Uh, there's a uh, there's a local message passing algorithm that was constructed by by these guys from from Stanford that shows that uh, if you if you do p rounds of message passing between neighbors on the graph, you can uh, get a, a get a get a uh, max. You can get a, a cut uh, where sort of this value that you care about approaches the Parisi value with an error that goes down like one over square root of p. Uh, yes. Uh, this Parisi value that you present, is yeah. this, what you showed us before was uh, true for p equals one, right? 
Is this, does this still have something to do with people? Or? Uh, so, no, not, not really, because uh, here we're looking at average case. So really, uh, you know, if you look at the average case, uh, before it was about worst case, you know, like basically you want to guarantee the, the, the ratio of like, the cut that you get to the maximum cut. Here, as d becomes large, the approximation ratio trivially becomes close to 1, because the second, half, second term just you know, vanishes. So, so really, you know, so what happens in the worst case is very different to what, what happens in, in what this average case. What's the worst case value again? Well, the worst case value, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not, so, I mean, so, so the worst case thing was only for d equals 3. Uh, and it was like, you know, this value, this number really should not be compared to the, to the worst case. Um, I would like to be able to compare the classical one with the worst case uh, value. Oh, I mean, uh, it's, I, I mean, again, they're really different settings. So, so like, if you can go to the worst case values. I mean, this is not really... You know, it's this, this uh, I mean, this is much worse, you know, compared to, you know, like, if you look at the approximation ratio, uh, uh, this is only, like, say, it guarantees a point, uh, point 0.7, essentially, right? But if you uh, just do random guessing, even, then you get half the edges, and the total, the maximum cut is, like, one half plus something that vanishes. So the approximation ratio is, like, arbitrarily close to one. So, so really, you know, they're not comparable. Is that maybe we can talk more about this if you're confused later? Okay. Uh, yeah. So also, you know, as I said, you know, earlier the SDP algorithm uh, is really the best for the worst case guarantees. But as you can see, this is not op it's not optimal. The low message passing is actually well, assuming this conjecture does better. So okay, what about the quantum algorithm, the QAOA? So you can also do a similar calculation uh, uh, and well, let's basically, again, rewrite the cup, fra the, uh, the cup fraction as sort of this one half plus the number that we care about divided by square root of d. And uh, so th there actually has been some results that calculated what this number is uh, for p equals 1. So for p equals 1, uh, if you assume that you have triangle free graphs, so basically any graph that doesn't have a triangle, uh, this is an example, I guess, where there's no triangles. Uh, you can show that the p equals 1 QA gets a number that's uh, 0.3, so that's uh, you know about slightly less than one half times the Parisi value. And as p equals two, assuming the graph doesn't have uh, uh, triangles, pentagons, or squares, that means uh, the the girth is greater than five. The the uh, QAOA gets a value that's uh, 0.4. So it improves, uh, but then again, you know, this calculation somehow got stopped because I guess there was some difficulty. Uh, and uh, and as I should mention also that here I'm talking about triangle free and, and girth uh, being greater than some number, but uh, this assumption of girth being large is actually equivalent of basically uh, looking at average cases, uh, because if you look at a random regular graph, the probability of basically having a small cycle becomes small as the system size gets large. So most neighborhoods, if you look at a random regular graph, looks like a tree. There's no cycles. There's no small circles. Question. Yeah. So, so sorry. I mean, does does this mean you know how to find this optimum, or does it just mean that the QAOA ansatz can produce an energy or cost function with that value, but you might actually not know how to obtain that parameters, those parameters? Uh, no, we know how to obtain those parameters. So these are like you, you know they gave you exact parameters for for these. Yeah, yeah, and that will be the case with the rest of my talk as well. Yeah. The the the, the tree like condition you mentioned is also the case in the classical algorithm. Yeah, so, so they can also do analysis. I mean, uh, that's how they analyze, for example, these things. Uh, the hard thing is overlap with that classical part and quantum part, intrinsically, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, the analysis is still a little bit more challenging in the quantum part, uh, as, uh, as I will show you. Uh, but uh, it definitely, you know, this tree-like structure really makes things simpler. So, so, uh, so exp yeah, exactly. So, so, so basically, exploiting this tree structure, uh, 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 our result from last year basically allow us to calculate the performance of the QAOA for this problem uh, uh, for basically any depth p using sort of a computation that only scales uh, exponentially in p instead of doubly exponential. 
so specifically for any D regular graph with girth larger than 2p plus 1, you can compute, we have a value to compute this exactly uh, for any uh, degree d and any set of parameters gamma and beta. And also, uh, interestingly, if you take the d goes to infinity limit, there's an analytical way of writing this formula uh, so that you can actually get a way to calculate this value using uh, quadratically better time and exponentially better memory. So that basic idea is that, you know, as I mentioned, you know, if you look at the subgraph induced uh, on by the Heisenberg uh, picture of the, uh, the single edge operator, uh, it looks like a tree, a regular tree on these regular graphs. Uh, and uh, because of the regularity of this, uh, of, of, this, of, of this graph, you can sort of exploit that uh, symmetry to do a very efficient analytical contraction of this tree tensor network. Sorry, this is all classical. There's no quantum computer involved anywhere. There's no quantum computers anywhere. We don't have one, so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> so, so all of this is computation on classical computers. But the point is that we can evaluate the performance of this quantum computer, but you have to run the, the algorithm on a quantum computer to get a bit string that, that achieves that value. Oh, I see. OK. Yeah. So we can calculate what the algorithm achieves, but we don't actually know how to produce a bit string that achieves that value unless you run it on a quantum computer. Oh, I see. So this would give you, this is a classical algorithm giving you the optimal gamma and beta, and Actually, also the actual also the actual value of the energy. value, but you don't get the actual bit string assignment from that. Exactly, you have to have a quantum computer to do that. I see. Okay, that's nice. Yeah. So uh, taking this, uh, you know, uh, calculation, we can actually get these values up to p equals twenty. So that's much better than p equals two and three that I mentioned before. Uh, so you know, as I mentioned, at p equals one, we agree with previous result where you get 0.3, and p equals two you get 0.4, and as you can see, it gets better and better. Uh, we actually optimize the parameters up to p equals 17, and we use the parameters uh, from the smaller p as a way to kind of extrapolate good guesses for the larger parameters at uh, p equals 18 through 20 uh, to kind of get a lower bound on the energy that you, you will achieve. Yeah. Sorry, I think you probably already mentioned. Uh, how, how many nodes are in your graphs that you're... So this is for arbitrary graphs uh, that has, that's deregular and has girth 2p plus 1. So it doesn't really matter how many nodes there are. I mean, so because of this girth condition, I guess technically the, the node needs to have the number of nodes need to be like at least d to the p, like d raised to the p power, because you need that many, you need as many, at least as many nodes as there are in this tree. So for any large enough graphs, uh, you basically, you know, most of the uh, if you look at any large enough random regular graph, basically this this formula applies. Does that so the, answer your question? So your cost doesn't depend on the number of nodes? The cost does not depend on, on the number of nodes. So you can think of uh, this as already taking the thermodynamic limit in some sense. Are you assuming anything about boundary conditions when you do that? Uh, no. So you can have things that loop and we are periodic boundary conditions? Uh, well, actually, so uh, we assume that there are no small loops. So any loop must be, be larger than 2p plus 1 length. In this graph, but large loops are okay. Then large loops are okay. Yes. So okay. So now let's plot these values, uh, specifically just the optimized one for a second. So we can see that you know, as a so here I'm plotting the value that you achieve as a function of one over p, uh, just so I can kind of see all the values in a compact way. And so basically, as you increase p, you go from bottom right to top left. And at p equals, I don't know if you guys can see this, at p equals 11 you pass sort of this 2 over pi value, which is the best proven performance for any assumption-free classical algorithm. Uh, but as I mentioned before, you know, if you consider this state-of-the-art algorithm that assumes this no OGB conjecture, uh, the local message passing algorithm uh, uh, after p rounds can get arbitrarily close to the, the true maximum energy, the Parisi value, uh, with an error that goes down like 1 over square root of p. So, so the girth here was p-dependent, right? So it's, it's for different graphs at every point, basically, right? Well, uh, different graph. Well, well, large curves meant that the girth was bigger than whatever, 2p plus 1 or so. Yeah, yeah. So it's a p-dependent thing, what we're looking here at. That, that yeah. The family of graphs. Yeah, although you can also think of it as simply looking at the thermodynamic limit, like take n, you know, extremely large, larger than, you know, like, you know, uh, basically d to the p. In, in, and then and in that setting, essentially this will, this will apply to all graphs that are sufficiently large. Uh, and basically, these values that you get 
uh, that basically will, will predicts exactly, exactly what the value you would get if you run those specific graphs that are large enough. So, okay, so, so okay, uh, okay, so comparing, uh, so we, even though uh, we, ha we have a provable result on the QAOA, which, pro uh, which beats the best proven performance of any uh, kind of classic algorithm, but you know, this no OGB conjecture is actually widely believed uh, as, uh, in the statistical physics community. Uh, so, so if you assume that's the case, okay, let's see, but, but you also kind of see that, you know, for the QAOA, you know, even though we only have data up to uh, P equals 20, uh, it does seem to also approach the Parisi value uh, sort of asymptotically. So let's try to see what the, the sort of the asymptotic is by doing a fit. Uh, so actually, what, what, uh, one tempting model to, do, uh, to, uh, to fit is basically some kind of power law, because I guess that's the same type of error bound uh, scaling as, uh, as, it, uh, as in the sort of this classical message passing algorithm. So if you do this power law fit, uh, uh, which I also allowed for offsets uh, to account for finite size effects, um, you kind of get a scaling where the, the, the exponent in sort of this P is roughly one. So, and also another thing is that this fit, this green line, it's only fitted for the, using the data from uh, P equals one through eight, yet it agrees with the data at, uh, you know, P between P and 17 quite well. So, so that's again, an indication that this model is, is actually, you know, pretty reasonable. So if you assume this sort of scaling, this, this error scaling from this fitted model is correct, then even against sort of this, the, this state of the art classical algorithm with this conjecture, you still get a quadratic speed up because you know, the error goes down like one over P instead of one over square root of P. Uh, yes, no. what, what, what is the complexity for this local message passing algorithm as a function of P? Essentially the same as QAOA. So it's uh, like actual, like, I mean, because you're struggling to find these parameters because the, the complexity is somewhat exponential in P. Yeah, so to calculate these things, yeah, like the calculation grows like 40 to P. Uh, but, uh, but if you have a quantum computer, then of course it will not be the case. So all of this is done on the classical computer. If you have a quantum computer, the complexity is, is just uh, P times like... But you still have to optimize the parameters somehow. Uh, obvious, but, that's easy. but I mean, there's a way to predict, I mean, parameters, essentially. I mean, I, I, can, I can talk more about that, but, but essentially there's a way to predict parameters. You don't need to optimize that much. Uh, yeah. well, the to be clear, that quadratic quantum advantage is not for the cost, but for the like performance against the curse, is it? Because P is the related to size curse. Uh, well, I mean, the girth maybe is sort of a red herring here. Really, like we're talking about, we don't actually need to require. We don't need to require the the graph to have actually exactly a large girth, as long as most of the neighborhoods are are tree like. Up to depth p, then it's it's it this this result will also apply. Yeah, but but I mean, what I'm saying is that quantum advantage is not for like the computational cost, is for like the advantage over the family of graph. Uh, no, it is for the it's data for the computational. Oh, cost. it's computational cost. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying here is that giving a large enough random regular graph, if you run p rounds of message passing oh, p's around, versus yeah. p rounds of QAOA, you get one over. You get quadratically better error. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you for clarification. Okay. So I should move on a bit, I think, because uh, I need to get through the rest of my slides. Uh, so, so, so here, uh, I guess, yeah. So here's some basically some I think encouraging evidence that even for something as simple as QAOA, uh, sort of this constant depth uh, regime uh, where we sort of take the thermodynamic limit, you still are able to be competitive with the state-of-the-art classical algorithms. Uh, so we actually uh, uh, looked at more general problems in a, in a different work. For example, we, we can look at not just uh, two uh, uh, problems where you only have two-body couplings. You can look at uh, problems with uh, Q-body couplings. So here, basically, you have, uh, in, you have interactions that involve like Q tuples of, of spins. An example of spin glass problems uh, uh, that people uh, study in, in this setting is uh, the fully connected Gaussian spin glass. So basically there you look at basically all to all connections <coughs> across all Q tuples, and you choose the, uh, the, the couplings to be uh, sort of uh, Gaussian with mean zero with a normalized variance so that the overall uh, sort of the uh, uh, energy is sort of uh, order n. 
And so for these problems, uh, as long as J is uh, drawn from some reasonable distribution uh, with mean zero, we can actually also give you an exact formula classically uh, uh, that can be classically evaluated uh, at NEP uh, for basically the ensemble averaged expectation of the cost function in, in the quantum state. So this calculation is actually done by proving uh, something uh, that we call the generalized multinomial theorem. Uh, but really, you can kind of, it has actually a very sort of a cute physics interpretation. You can think of it as a, a, as a rigorous version of a path integral calculation. So, so uh, you know, as you guys know, uh, probably, that you know, if you look at expectation of uh, an observable in a quantum circuit, you can kind of write it as a sum over path. Uh, and for the case of these uh, disorder averaged uh, uh, Gaussian spin glasses, you can write it as a, sort of a multinomial sum, where basically you, 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 you count the number of possible paths across that, that, that each uh, qubit sees. Uh, and in the large n limit, you can kind of imagine taking a continuum limit, uh, where you basically so, uh, kind of uh, integrating over all possible paths that uh, the spins can see. Uh, and uh, you get a form of the, of the expectation that looks like this. So you have some e to the n times uh, some action, which is sort of, uh, and the only place that, 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 that the system size appears is, uh, is here. So all the, the, this action s and uh, the thing downstairs f, uh, they're independent of n. So you could apply the saddle point approximation in the large n limit to, to get an answer. And this is uh, sort of a, a non-rigorous way of calculating this. But we actually made it rigorous by proving sort of uh, this multinomial theorem. So this calculational tool allows us not only to you know, predict what the energy uh, uh, obtained by the QAOA algorithm uh, is, but also uh, allows us to prove something like concentration uh, uh, and, uh, by calculating, calculating the second moment. So, so what, what, what I mean is that you know, if you look at the expectation of the cost function square inside the, the quantum state, it's equal to the expectation uh, uh, squared. Uh, and, this exp and this square is both outside the quantum state uh, as well as the disorder averaging. And this is actually a very strong form of concentration because it implies that you uh, concent concentrate uh, not only over instances, uh, which means that you know different random instances drawn from the ensemble has very uh, have basically the same energy value at at the at the any specified parameters. Uh, you also concentrate over measurements. So so if you give me a random instance uh, and uh, and I, if you, if I measure like with high probability the 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 energy that you get from the bit string uh, is sort of this uh, the, the 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 average value that we calculate. So this you know, points to a possibility that you can also use uh, you know, this type of answers to prepare, say, excited states you know, if, you, if you care about them. Uh, but it also implies that uh, uh, because of the fact that the energy that you get for different instances uh, concentrate, you can reuse optimized parameters for one instance for, uh, for another. So this is kind of what I mean by predicting parameters earlier. And this is also true of even in a non-local regime, as I mentioned, because here we can do this calculation for all to connected uh, spin glasses. Uh, and this is sort of uh, a, a big improvement over previous result where you rely on sort of the graph uh, being sparse and you have sort of this local light cone. So this is, uh, you know, this is a much more powerful result. Okay, so. Uh, to summarize uh, the, the part about classical uh, minim, minim, uh, energy minimization, uh, we are able to uh, do rigorous analysis of the QAOA to high depth, uh, uh, improving the doubly exponential cost to only exponential. Uh, and we have uh, provided evidence for showing a quantum advantage in solving uh, uh, classical problems uh, by looking at the problem of random graph max cut. Uh, in particular, we show that at P equals 11 or and higher, QAOA outperforms all assumption-free polynomial time uh, classical algorithms. And even with you know, mild assumptions, QAOA appears to have a quadratic quantum advantage. Uh, and uh, I would also like to point to you to a different uh, recent paper by Sami uh, Bulibne and Ashley Montanaro, where they also show evidence of our polynomial uh, advantage of QAOA on solving random case set. Uh, and we are also able to prove concentration uh, and actually a hardness result, which I haven't had time to talk about, uh, even in a regime where uh, the graph is all to all connected and you have very non-local correlations, uh, whereas only uh, previous results only hold when the light cone is local. 
So very interesting open questions are, since this is the you know, workshop uh, in the context of mathematical challenges for quantum computing, uh, I'd like to also challenge the more math math uh, mathematically minded uh, uh, people in the audience. Uh, there's some very interesting questions here, I think. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, you know, can we somehow prove that this uh, value of the QAOA converges to the pre value? What I've shown earlier is just a fit, but I think that it will be very uh, valuable if we can somehow come up with a continuum formalism that, that actually uh, can allow us to understand these uh, uh, energy values in the, in the large depth limit as well. And also, every, all the results I've talked to you about, uh, they're regress, but they only apply when p is constant. So the, currently, there's no actual regress results on QAA whenever p is greater than log n. So, so that's a, another very interesting frontier. Uh, and in particular, you know, it's still unclear whether or not uh, 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 Barriers for classical optimization algorithms like uh, this OGP, which uh, you know I don't have time to talk about, but feel free to ask me about, uh, about it later. Uh, the question is, can they be overcome by any quantum algorithm? Okay. So, uh, are there any questions before I move on to the quantum part? Yeah. So, uh, about this quadratic quantum advantage. So, often when you see a quadratic speed up in quantum, it's because of Grover or amplitude application or something. But this doesn't look like that. Is, it, is there any connection or? Not as far as that we can tell. I mean, because if you apply Grover's algorithm, you know, it's an exponential time algorithm in some sense. Uh, uh, but here, you know, we're not really doing that. Uh, and I guess, you know, one intuition that I have is that you know, there are some similarities between the QAOA and message passing, in the sense that you, you know, every round you talk to, you, you kind of, you know, create correlations between neighbors on the graph. So maybe, you know, there's some, uh, you know, uh, uh, opportunity there to kind of maybe understand, you know, if there's a way to quantize message passing sort of in a way that's similar to QAOA. Okay, so now for the second part, uh, and so I've talked about minimizing energy of classical systems, but quantum systems uh, is what a lot of people in the audience I think are, are very interested in because this is a quantum antibody physics uh, workshop after all. So, uh, so uh, we know actually from sort of complexity theory results that ground states, uh, or also known as global minima of quantum systems, are hard to find, even for nature. So, uh, I mean, this is sort of because of the fact that we know, we, we don't expect quantum computers to, to find ground states of quantum systems uh, in general. And, and, uh, and we also, if you, can, if you assume that quantum computers can simulate nature, that also means that nature don't find ground states in general. So that, that also kind of means that, okay, if these ground states are, generally hard to find, maybe they're not really physical. We don't necessarily care about them. You know, if nature have a hard time finding them, why would we care about them you know, at all? And maybe the, the, the right question to ask is, uh, you know, what is, how, how hard is the problem of finding a local minimum uh, in quantum systems? And in particular, we're interested in uh, you know, the question of you know, how, how tractable is this problem of finding local minimum using classical and quantum computers. So, to, to, uh, to address this question, let's first need to define what a local minimum is. Excuse me. Is the question finding some local minima or exploring the set of local minima? Uh, so the way we'll define it is any local minimum. And in particular, it's actually not a state. We just want to uh, find the expectation of a given observable in, in any of the local minima. So that's the problem that, we'll be care, that we will care about. OK, but first, let's build that definition up, let's first define what a local minimum is. So here, you know, in a quantum system, the setting uh, is that you have a domain that's an n qubit state, and the energy function is you know, some expectation of a Hamiltonian. Uh, but then you also need to define a, a family of perturbations that you care about. Uh, for example, this could be some you know, local unitaries, uh, like you know, in VQE, uh, or it could be you know, Limbladian evolution or, or quantum channel. So any, any way that can sort of uh, can perturb quantum states, uh, you could consider that as a family of perturbations. So, uh, so we, call a dense, or we call quantum states rho as a, a, a epsilon approximate local minimum whenever, you know, if you uh, basically uh, per perturb the state, uh, it has to be at least, uh, it has to only, it has to increase energy up to sort of this epsilon error uh, uh, that, that also uh, scales with uh, sort of the, the, the sort of the size of the perturbation for but basically for all small enough uh, sort of uh, perturbation uh, parameters data. 
Uh, so to kind of, you know, this is sort of a mathematical definition, but to kind of motivate this a bit. Uh, so like, let's consider, for example, two points in this sort of energy landscape uh, where I kind of simplify things so the quantum state is just one dimensional. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, arguably, you know, uh, you don't want, the, the, the point on the uh, left is what you will consider to be a local minimum, but not the one on the right. Uh, but also, uh, you know, the, we also need to account for the fact that, you know, there's imprecisions when you, when you, you know, measure energy, et cetera. So, so even though this point maybe on the left is not exactly at the bottom, uh, we still want to call that the local minimum. So what you do is, you know, what this mathematical definition does is that you basically look at, you know, uh, the sort of the, the neighborhood uh, 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 around these states. And whenever the, the energy uh, is above sort of this, sort of uh, this, uh, sort of this, uh, I guess this these lines that 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 uh, that kind of you know is set by the precision parameter epsilon. Uh, you call that a local minimum. So so here you know because the energy kind of goes goes below these lines, uh, you, that's not a local minimum. But here you know the the the, the, the landscape the, uh, the energy sort of you know stays above these lines. That that is a local minimum, uh, at least in the approximate sense. So. Given this sort of uh, definition, uh, I would like to just you know make sure you guys are following this definition. I'm going to have a little pop quiz. Uh, so here are four points on, on this energy landscape. So which points are epsilon approximate local minimum? Uh, there's four. Is the multiple choice question? Anyone? All of them. See, all of them. All of them? Oh, not all B. except B. Not B. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's A, C, and D, not B. Because B is, you know, the, the energy falls below this line. And that's really, you know, sh I mean, intuitively, that should also shouldn't be a local minimum because, you know, it's the so top it of a very... It fall below this line for very small theta, no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, uh, because, I mean, if you choose the epsilon to be small enough, so the, you know, this, this, this like, gradient lines are sufficiently flat, then, you know, this thing falls you know, completely below the, those lines, right? So, so you would I'm, not... I'm sorry, I'm a bit confused. The derivative of that thing is zero, right? So, yeah, so... so the, initially... Um, but that's not really a local minimum, right? I mean, like, you know, that, that's... Yeah, a, it, it's, it's about your definition, it's not like... No, no, we don't look at... The point is that we don't look at derivatives. Derivatives are too, too weak of a definition for local minimums. Right. So that's why we do this more fancier... I, I think my point is about the small enough, right? If yeah. the small enough theta can depend on epsilon, then it should be a local minimum. Uh, no, I mean, what, what, uh, what, I mean, there so is if, no, if, if, if I zoom enough, regardless of what epsilon is, there, it will be below the line. There will right? not be, right? Because if you pick those epsilon to be uh, sufficiently small, uh, and it's, you know, flat, if, it's flat, no? I mean, you have a slope epsilon, which is strictly positive, and it's completely flat, the function, right? You will fall it's below. It's not completely flat. There's a, there's a, I mean, it's a, it's a, there's so a, there's a non trivial it's, second derivative, right? I mean, so. Yeah, but if I zoom enough, I don't see the second derivative. My point is, if your theta can be as small as you want, right, below epsilon squared, then it will satisfy your definition. So it only works if the theta is independent of epsilon, right? So you say there has to be a, a theta zero and inside that radius for all epsilon. Is I don't think that's true, but maybe we should I, not I, draw but it's, important, it's important. Ordering of quantifiers is very important. <laughs> no, I don't think the theta <laughs> here does not need to be dependent on epsilon. It, as long as it's like, you know, for some... You, you fix epsilon, and you, you take theta to be any like non-zero neighborhood. So what? what no, you if the neighborhood is epsilon enough? dependent, it's, it's just wrong. No? So it's small enough. No, because the thing is that like you know if if uh, sorry. What you what you want to say is small enough, but not too small. I mean, we can maybe settle for that, but I think the thing is you want a, a neighborhood which is epsilon independent. Yeah, yeah no, I agree with you. I agree with you agree? Okay, good. I, I think that's very important. No, I mean you can't just like like shuffle around your quantifiers. <laughs> Well, okay, I'm pretty sure that we don't need to have that uh, epsilon dependence in the theta, but maybe we should, I don't know. I, I, think, I think we should if, chat about this. If the quiz is important, then it's important. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the quiz is not important. <laughs> it's hard to, uh, I don't know, like, I, I mean, I think this is not really important for the results. I mean, may, maybe, maybe for now I'll, you know, I can maybe come up with an alternative definition where I also put a minimum on the theta if, if that makes you happier. But I think that the, I mean, the point here is I really, you know, uh, uh, I mean, we, we have spent some time coming up with a definition that captures, uh, you know, this notion of local minimum where, you know, something like B is not a local minimum, but something like D is because it's sort of a, on a flat sort of bearing plateau type, type uh, landscape. 
OK, so okay, now I'm going to define the problem of finding a local minimum. So the, the input to the problem is that you have a, a Hamiltonian, and you, and you give me some uh, observable, and also some family of perturbations, and also some epsilon, which you know, usually, because of efficiency reasons, we want it to be at least 1 over poly. Uh, also, I guess there's a condition that the energy, the, the, the norm of the Hamiltonian is to be polynomial, because I guess if you have an exponentially large uh, range of energy, it could also be inefficient to traverse this landscape. Now, Given this input, the problem of finding a local minimum as we define it is that you want to output an estimated value of an expectation of an observable within epsilon error for any of the epsilon local uh, approximate local minimum under the perturbations. So we don't need to find any particular one. We just, you know, if you give me any one of them, we're satisfied for this problem. So, and uh, if the perturbations are sufficiently smooth, and if the, if the action of this perturbation can be simulated on a quantum computer, it's not surprising to see that this problem can be efficiently solved using a, a sort of a type of gradient descent on a quantum computer. I mean, I mean the, the intuition is basically, you know, you can, uh, you can uh, calculate gradients uh, locally uh, in, in this landscape uh, to kind of decide where to go, and, uh, and you essentially then can apply the, the, the perturbations in, in the direction where the gradients are decreasing, and you keep doing this until the gradients are small enough. And that exactly satisfied the, the condition that uh, we talked about earlier about the epsilon approximate local minimums. So the two families of perturbations that we are uh, interested in uh, is, uh, the first one is uh, the, uh, the local unitary perturbations that I briefly alluded to. So here, for example, you can think of it as evolution under uh, basically some unitary uh, generated by uh, one or two qubit uh, poly operators, for example. And the other family of perturbations uh, is what we call thermal perturbations. So these are supposed to uh, uh, mimic what happens if you couple a quantum system uh, weakly uh, to a thermal bath at some fixed temperature uh, with some uh, 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 sort of characteristic time scale tau. Uh, and uh, the important point, uh, part, uh, the important uh, fact about this thermal perturbation is that you know, all this data has to be uh, positive because in general, in blotting evolutions are not reversible. Uh, and just to kind of quickly kind of maybe give you a sense of what this Limbladian looks like, essentially uh, what they are is that uh, you are, uh, they're a rigorous version of this Davies generator uh, that was derived in the 70s uh, to kind of uh, to formulate the, the, the action of uh, basically coupling a, a, a system weakly to, to a bath. Uh, uh, and uh, basically what happens here is that you have some jump operators A, uh, uh, which are actually uh, uh, filtered uh, through sort of this uh, uh, operator Fourier transform. So basically, you look at the Heisenberg picture of the operator, and you look at the Fourier transform of that. And, and this basically, you know, what this is, is this is the part, the action of the local jump operator that couples energy eigenstates that differ by uh, energy omega. And uh, when you couple this to a thermal system, there's sort of this favor, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the bath sort usually uh, favors sort of uh, 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 cooling transitions over heating transitions. So that's sort of reflected in this transition weight. So basically, uh, uh, this is usually chosen uh, based on phenomenology. For example, you can use global dynamic, uh, 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 where basically the weight uh, is something like 1 over 1 plus e to the beta uh, omega. Minutes. Sorry? 10 more minutes. OK, OK. Uh, so basically, when, when the energy change omega is positive, you know, this is exponentially suppressed. But when it's, when it's negative, you know, it's basically order 1. So first, the uh, result, which is sort of you know, not surprising, is that finding a local minimum under local unitary perturbations is actually classically easy. Uh, and to see this uh, is basically a simple way to see this is that uh, if you look at, give me any local Hamiltonians, uh, you can prove that any sort of hard random state is a local minima uh, with an with a epsilon precision parameter that's like, you can make it uh, very small, even exponentially small. Uh, what that means is that uh, you know, since any hard random state is a local minimum, there's like doubly exponentially many local minimas because there's doubly exponentially many uh, hard random states in, uh, if you kind of consider sort of some uh, some epsilon uh, uh, covering that. Uh, now, then in this case, because there's so many local minimums, finding a local minimum is actually classically easy. You can just output uh, basically what you would uh, get from a hard random state uh, and in which case it's just a trace of the observable. 
So even the, so here, you know, we made the local minimum problem so easy that it's even classically solvable in a, in a quantum system. So this is not really the right notion uh, uh, of sort of local minimum, and this is sort of the same phenomenon that we uh, that underlies sort of these Baer and Plateau problems in, in uh, VQE. But okay, finding uh, what about finding local minimum under thermal perturbations? So what we actually proved is that for certain two-dimensional uh, BQP hard Hamiltonians whose ground states encode uh, a universal quantum computation, so this basically uh, are a system where the ground state look like uh, some kind of superposition over the computational history of some uh, uh, of a circuit. We actually showed that uh, under thermal perturbations, these Hamiltonians have no suboptimal local minima for sufficiently uh, large beta and tau and one over epsilon. Uh, and that basically means that you know, all the only the, all the local minima that you get will be uh, will be the ground state, uh, and uh, and and that also means that uh, you know uh, because of the fact that you know basically if you if you apply some kind of gradient descent, uh, you you, uh, you know in the, in the quantum setting you can always cool to the ground state because you know you you guaranteed to find a local minimum and the, any local minimum has to be the ground state. And because of the fact that estimating a local observable in this ground state is BQB hard, because that corresponds to estimating uh, output, output observables of like in the quantum circuit, that basically means that uh, finding a local minimum here is classically hard, assuming quantum computers cannot be uh, classically simulated. Uh, so on, on the other hand, uh, if you, you know, apply this sort the thermal gradient descent uh, uh, idea that I mentioned earlier, uh, you, you can find local minimums. So uh, I'm gonna just gonna briefly flash this because I'm running out of time. Uh, so the idea basically is that if you assume the Hamiltonian is bounded uh, in, in energy, then you can simply you know, do this step I mentioned. You start from any state, you could be the maximally mixed state, and you look at the gradient from each of the possible perturbations generated by the, uh, the local jump uh, Limbladians, uh, and you estimate the gradients to some precision, you find a direction that decreases the energy. If such a direction exists, then you simply evolve uh, with the appropriately chosen step size in that direction. And if, if, there's, no di if there's no direction where the, the gradient is negative, uh, you essentially have found the uh, epsilon approximate local minimum, you can terminate the algorithm. And we, we can prove that this sort of this thermal gradient descent algorithm uh, converges within number of, uh, within sort of this uh, B cube over epsilon square steps. So assuming B is polynomial, and you only care about epsilon, that's like one over polynomial, uh, you know, you, this quantum thermal gradient descent algorithm will converge in polynomial time. So 0.01, you have to tune, make it like more accurate in the course of it, or it's just fixed actually? Uh, I mean, these are chosen for proof, proof purposes. I mean, basically... You can choose them fixed. That's, that's you can choose them to be fixed, yeah. In this, do you have to assume a, a con convergence time result on how fast the Lin Bladian converges, or uh, if you say you're going to the, you, you evolve it in time, but if the time is forever? Well, so uh, we usually don't want to evolve for a long time because you know uh, you you want to basically continually to update your direction because you know maybe the direction you are picking. De uh, decrease the energy within a short time, but you could increase the energy in a long time limit, right? So, so, uh, so you know that it, it's short because for an arbitrary Bladian, I have a hard time proving that it's always yeah, short. yeah, exactly. So, so for this thermal Bladians, we can use the analytical properties that you know that that was rigorously formulated, you know, so to show that whenever the energy of the whenever the original Hamiltonian is bounded, you can also you can bound the second derivative, you know, with with a similar bound. Okay, so, so what I've shown is basically that you know, there's a quantum advantage in the problem of finding local minima. Uh, you can, uh, and specifically, just even the, 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 the task of just cooling. Uh, and, and, and that comes from the fact that we showed for some quantum systems, uh, finding a local minimum under thermal perturbations is classically hard and quantumly easy. Uh, but on the other hand, for you know, typical systems that we encounter, Classical algorithms are nonetheless used uh, routinely. You know, like we see all these successes that was mentioned uh, earlier this week uh, with like tensor network, DFTs, uh, etc. So, but what does that leave us with? I mean, you know, can we somehow identify opportunities where you know finding a local minimum is actually classically hard? Well, here's one possible idea. 
uh, if you, you know, have some classical algorithm uh, that you know, is optimizing some classical LSS, such as you know, tensor network or neural networks or something, and you're trying to minimize the energy with respect to some Hamiltonian, what you could do is that you could try to calculate the thermal gradient at that classical onset state. Uh, and this comes from the fact that, you know, uh, basically this, this gradient is essentially the expectation of sort of this Heisenberg picture of the, uh, of the, the Hamiltonian. And for a lot of situations, such as, you know, when, uh, you know, the, the coarse graining time tau is short or when H is commuting, this uh, L dagger H is a quasi-local observable. So if you can somehow evaluate these local observables on a classical ansatz, you can also calculate gradients without having access to a quantum computer. So basically, you know, if you find a situation where the classical ansatz uh, uh, gives you a, a, this classically calculated gradient that's sufficiently negative, that also means that, you know, it's actually meaningful to try to run a quantum thermal gradient descent on, on this problem on a quantum computer, that, you know, that's a one way to identify an opportunity for quantum advantage. Uh, so I don't have too much time left. So yeah, I can show you either the construction of these Hamiltonians, uh, you know, or I can tell you more about the energy landscape. Is there a preference that people have? You're kind of out of time. OK, so all right. Maybe a summary. <laughs> Summa OK, summary. Uh, well, I'm just going to quickly say this. So, so even though we've shown that, you know, for some, this could be hard Hamiltonians, the energy landscape has this very nice shape that all the local minimum are global minimums. It's not always true. So, for example, if you just even look at a simple system of Ising spin chains, whenever you have, you know, like the, the ground states are basically either all ones or zeros, uh, but any state that has a domain one that are sufficiently far apart, that's the local minimum because, you know, local moves don't actually, you know, increase the energy. But then again, uh, these local minimums are short-lived because you know, if you, like, kind of, if you apply local jumps, uh, uh, then this domain wall was kind of diffusively move around. And whenever you have k domain walls, the lifetime is roughly like water n over k square. Uh, so that's sort of a mild version of a landscape with a lot of local minimums, uh, uh, but each one of them has short lifetime. But uh, here's a more kind of drastic example of a bad energy landscape. If you have a QMA hard Hamiltonians, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, basically, you know, you, uh, you, you're trying to find a particular witness quantum state that, you know, gives you an output of a local observable that's either one or zero. So that also means that for many, many quantum states that are not close to the witness state, uh, the energy is essentially flat in, uh, in this QMA Hamiltonian. So you have these barren plateaus. And only for the, you know, specific uh, state that's, you know, that the QMA circuit accepts as a witness, uh, you are able to get this uh, dropping energy. So, so this is an example where, you know, even under thermal perturbations, there's a lot of barren plateaus. So in summary, uh, for classical system, I have shown you evidence for quantum advantage for solving certain diluted spin glass problems. Uh, but more work needs to be done for larger advantages. And in particular, I think it's a very interesting question whether we can overcome provable barriers uh, for classical algorithms, such as the OGP. Uh, for quantum systems, I have shown you that uh, I've proven that um, finding local minimas in quantum systems under thermal perturbations is classically hard and quantumly easy. And there's exciting opportunities for studying energy landscapes. For example, identifying these possible opportunities for quantum advantage by evaluating thermal gradients, like I just mentioned. And also, potentially, this picture of energy landscape could provide a new perspective for classifying quantum phases and maybe you know, help us actually uh, clarify what the notion of a quantum spin glass is. That's all. Thank you.